We're going to look tonight in the first chapter of the Gospel of John at one verse for the uh, basis of our lesson, and that's verse number 14. Uh, verse number 14 of the first chapter of John. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. What a wonderful verse of Scripture. And hopefully we can unpack it just a little bit tonight and uh, tie it into Christmas. Uh, I want to talk to us for just a few minutes about the miracle of the Incarnation. Um, have a lot to share with you about that. And you might uh, say, well, we talked about that last week, and to a degree we did, because we, we talked about the virgin birth. I guess the way I put it together in my mind, the way I think of it, is that the Incarnation is the master plan of the Lord, and the virgin birth is how that plan was fulfilled. So the two do connect. They go together, in my mind, very closely connected. But uh, um, for the first time in my years of uh, ministry, I've taken a look at, at, at the subject of the Incarnation. I don't, as far as I know, I've talked about it, I've mentioned it, but I've never done a lesson on it before. So this is kind of brand new for me but very interesting and helpful to me, and I hope it will be to you. I know that you are well aware of the fact that Christmas is often depicted as a time when there's miraculous activities. Um, Hollywood is pretty good at presenting it that way. Uh, we have a lot of theater movies and TV movies that we're watching these days on Hallmark, Great American Family, and so forth. And they talk about the miracles of Christmas. There are a number of those uh, that are depicted in the way that they write the scripts and so forth for the movies and uh, um, the presentations that we watch. Probably one of the most famous is, I believe the name of it is Miracle on 34th Street. Is that right? I guess everybody has seen that many, many times over the years, and I hear people talking about that being uh, one of their favorite movies that they always like to watch every year. But the real truth is this, I think, that the spiritual meaning of Christmas disclosed through the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ should remind everyone of the greatest miracle that has ever been performed, and that miracle was the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the greatest of all miracles that has ever been performed. Now, there are a lot of miracles that we could talk about, biblical examples of uh, miraculous things. Like, for example, we could talk about what God did when Israel... <coughs> Uh, under the leadership of Moses was at the Red Sea and it, the army of Egypt was coming behind them. They needed to move forward. A tremendous miracle was performed as the wind blew that night and God parted those waters and Israel was able to go over uh, to the other side on dry ground. That was a tremendous miracle. Uh, the feeding of Israel in the wilderness with the manna was a, uh, a tremendous miracle. Uh, the list goes on and on. We could talk a lot about that. But I believe, at least in my way of thinking, as I look at this and think about what John says here in this passage, I believe the greatest miracle that's ever been performed is that of the incarnation of the Son of God. As we look at this miracle through the eyes of John, which is what I want us to do tonight, we see real quickly that he, his approach is very different from that of Matthew and Luke. In the first chapters of Matthew and Luke, we have more details given to us about the birth 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have the details about the shepherds, the angelic host. We have the details about the wise men coming to see the Christ child. But when we get to the Gospel of John, chapter 1, where we would probably expect John's rendition of that, he just dispenses with all of the details and uh, does the shortcut version, I call it. The shortcut version of the birth of Christ. And he simply says in a handful of words what Matthew and Luke said in a whole lot of words the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That's it. That's the powerful truth that He conveys. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. As I think about what He has to say here, I am reminded of three very important words that I think are connected to this event. Of course, the word incarnation is connected. But we need to understand some things about this word. I found it interesting as I began to study and prepare for this lesson uh, that while we use this word and while my Bible has a division in the first chapter of the Gospel of John, my Schofield Bible has a division and a header at the beginning of verse number 14 that says the incarnation with references back to Matthew, to Luke, and to Romans. So, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, where else in the Bible do we find this word, the word incarnation? I don't know if you were aware of it or not, but this is not a word that's found in the Bible, not in the King James Version of the Bible. I, uh, I don't follow after the other versions, so I didn't uh, research any of them, but in the King James Version, we do not have the word incarnation. However, it's a great word, a very important word for us, for its real meaning best describes what took place. The word incarnation, of course, has a root word, uh, as many words do, and that root word is the word incarnate, which simply means to be made flesh, to be made flesh. Um, so from a theological standpoint, biblical perspective, uh, then it speaks of the taking on of a human body by the second person of the Trinity as he was known to be, the second person of the Godhead, the joining together of the divine nature and the human nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not one replacing the other, the human nature not replacing the divine nature, but the joining together of the divine nature and the human nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. And for that definition, you can go to Webster's Dictionary and pick that up. So I share that with you tonight. So John says the Word was made flesh as he describes the miraculous conception and the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's all the details he gives us. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And then he goes right on with talking about John the Baptist and the witness of John the Baptist, the forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ starting in verse 15 of this passage. In this statement, John implies, I believe, that the Word existed before this event. So what he actually does in verse 14, he connects what he's saying here with what he began with in verse number 1 of chapter 1, where he says, in the beginning was the Word. 
And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The second person of the Godhead was with God, the Father, in the very beginning. So he didn't just begin to exist whenever he came into this world. He existed beforehand. He existed uh, when the world was formed and the foundation of the world was laid. He existed with the Father. But at the appointed time, He was made flesh to dwell among us. And the writer of Hebrews aligns very well with what John has to say and the idea that John is uh, sharing here in this passage by saying these words, and I refer you to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5, in part where the writer says, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared for me. God the Father prepared a body for God the Son to come into this world in. And that's the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul referred to this great miracle as being the mystery of God or the mystery of godliness. Colossians chapter 2, verse 2, he talks about it being the mystery of God. Going further in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, Paul had these words to say as he talked about the mystery being Christ, whom he identified as God, coming from the scripture, God manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up to glory. That's a, that is a very, very few word description of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Not many words. He didn't mince words. He didn't have to put a whole lot of words together. He says he was manifest. He was made flesh. He came in the flesh. God incarnate is Christ in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by the angels who witnessed his birth there in Bethlehem on that first Christmas night as we refer to it. Of course, he was offered to the Jews, but they rejected him. And when they rejected him and they crucified him, he arose from the dead, of course, as we know. And salvation was then offered to the Gentiles. He was believed on in the world. And he returned back to his father where he is still tonight seated, interceding for you and me and extending, as I put it in my own words, a warm and loving invitation to whosoever will let them come and partake of the water of life freely. So I hope you join with me in concluding that Christ who was in the beginning when the foundation of the world was laid at the appointed time became flesh and walked here on earth among men. I hope we all agree to that without any doubt in our mind of its validity because that's a powerful truth of the Bible, a powerful truth, the greatest of all miracles the incarnation as we apply that word to the advent of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ and his coming into this world. Now, why did he do that? Well, we all have our ways of answering that question, I'm sure. Why? Let me share with you two things that 
John gives us an understanding of here in verse 14 that are implied that I think explain the why that all of this occurred just like it occurred and why God in his infinite wisdom planned that his son would come into this world and take on the form of human flesh. First reason is when we look at and consider a, a second word in addition to the word incarnation, it's the word identification. For here in the second part of verse 14, John says that the word which became flesh, now I'm zeroing in on these words, dwelt among us, dwelt among us. The word dwelt there comes from a Greek word which means to tabernacle or if you were to kind of envision what John is describing here, it was as if Jesus placed himself in the form of a tent here upon this earth to dwell among men. He tabernacled with men after he took upon himself the flesh. He was not an invisible idea like some people experience. And you say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, I don't know if you've ever come across people, but you've seen depictions in movies and so forth of people who have an invisible friend that they talk to and associate with. Anybody ever known of anybody that, I mean, they, have, they literally talk to them. And they say that uh, the invisible friend talks back to them, you know. Uh, it's a figment of imagination, of course. I guess that's the right way to say it. But I stand before you to remind all of us, as we already know, that that was not the case with Christ. He was not an invisible idea and figure of the imagination of men. He was a person, just like I'm a person, just like you are a person who walked here upon this earth and uh, he lived a real life, just like you and I live life. He lived life. So here upon this earth, John says he dwelt among us. He tabernacled with us. He lived in our midst. We saw him as he walked before us. He walked with us as a friend. You think about what all of that meant. With the Lord Jesus here, once he grew into manhood and started in his earthly ministry, walking with men, choosing his disciples and so forth. He walked with them as friends. He ate and he drank with them as his associates, just as they were doing. He had to have water. He had to have food. He had to be sustained because he had a physical human body, just like all of his friends and all of those that he was walking with. He was like, a family member to them. He slept with them. He lived with them each and every day. When they hurt, he hurt. When they needed compassion, he had compassion on them. When they needed to be shown love, he showed love to them, just like we show love to one, to one another. When they rejoiced, he rejoiced. When they were sad, he was sad. He was one of them. Or might we say, he was one of us. He was, and whenever I bring it to that level, what I'm talking about, he was one of humanity. He was one of mankind, just like all of us are a part of mankind and a part of humanity. So what John is saying here is, he dwelt among us, and we were able to see him do all of these things. And these things proved to us that he was indeed God in the flesh. 
that he had taken on the form of flesh, it proved the truthfulness of his incarnation. Through these actions, Jesus identified himself with mankind in every way. Now think about it. He who had communed with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, the one who had had conversation with Abraham and made the covenant with Abraham, the one who had previously dwelt in the miraculous pillow of cloud of a cloud that was guiding the children of Israel once they were delivered from their bondage in Egypt. The cloud by day, the pillow of fire by night, the one who dwelt in the wilderness tabernacle with them after that tabernacle was constructed in accord with his uh, description for it and his specifications for it. And the Shekinah glory of the Lord came down and filled that tabernacle. The one who did that, the one who spoke to the Old Testament prophets, he became obedient to his heavenly Father who enrobed him in flesh to dwell for a necessary time here upon this earth with mankind. Why? Why did he do that? Look at the third word. And I give you the word intervention. Intervention. Because John describes Jesus as being full of grace and truth in the third part of verse number 14. First part, the word was made flesh. Second part, he dwelt among us. The third part, he was full of grace and truth. But pastor, you left out something. Oh no, we're going to come back to that. We'll get there. Just, just hang with me for a minute. So the third thing that John says here is that he was full of grace and truth. Why was that important? I submit unto you that mankind needed grace. They needed to know what true love, we needed to know what true love would be all about. Mankind needed truth. That means that we needed light so that we could understand our situation. You see, no member of the human race, as you well know, could meet such needs. For sin had rendered all to be in a depraved state. When Adam and Eve partook of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil that stood in the midst of the garden, when they did that, you know well, for we've talked about it before, that through that sin, the entire human race was cast into and under the condemnation and the penalty of sin. No one in the human race could meet the need of removing that sin. All were depraved. Therefore, God the Father saw fit in His plan to enrobe His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to enter this world to intervene on our behalf. Because He came full of grace and truth. He came to bring that love that we needed and the light that we needed to show us what our real need was. So he who is truth brought real light into the world for all to see their hopeless situation. And there's not a person in this world today who has achieved the age of accountability of knowing right from wrong that can point a finger at God and say, I don't know what my depraved situation is. You say, well, what about those people that have never heard the gospel? Paul said this in Romans chapter 1, the invisible things of him are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. 
powerful words right there, aren't they? Powerful words. He who is grace brought a special loving favor into the world that is not based on merit. It is a mercy motivated by a love like no other to be found anywhere in this world. That should cause us to rejoice in this season of the year, knowing that God the Father enrobed His Son in the, with, with a human body to come into this world to identify with us and to ultimately intervene on our behalf to meet the need that we had that we could not meet ourselves. I love the words of the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 7, where he said this, But God, who is rich in mercy, for His great love wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. What great, great words from the Apostle Paul. I remain, therefore, forever grateful that Christ identified with me and intervened for me in his hum human form, in his human body, dying for me on the cross so that I could have that life and that hope of eternal bliss of being with him on the other side. I don't know if that helps you with this verse or not. That's, uh, that's a whole lot to absorb and take in. But it's here. It's a powerful verse. But like I said a minute ago, you would say, but Pastor Joe, you left out about half of the verse. Well, let's, in our closing time here, and I am going to close real quickly now, you'll notice that there are words here that if you don't pay attention to the punctuation that's in the verse, you just read it all together and you say, was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, even the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. But notice that those words, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, are in parenthesis. If you've never seen that before, please note it tonight. Those words are in parenthesis. So a true rendering without the parenthesis of, the, uh, of, of this passage would be, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. Why were these other words put in here by John? Well, I have a suggestion for you. I'm not going to tell you that I'm absolutely right, but I sure do like the thought <clears throat> that has been conveyed to my heart from the Lord. I think what's happening here is John pens these words. Great indeed they are. In his mind, he's beginning to take a journey down memory lane. And as he goes down memory lane, he thinks about the days when Jesus a few years before he wrote these words, which were, of course, sometime after the ascension of Christ back to heaven, he's thinking about seeing the Lord Jesus Christ in his human form walking here upon the earth. And he's saying, we beheld his glory. I saw it. I saw him while he was walking here upon this earth. We beheld His glory. And as John thinks about that, in my way of thinking, I believe he probably becomes overwhelmed with his admiration for the Lord Jesus Christ. 
because it's probably quite likely that as he's traveling this journey down memory lane, he goes back in his mind instantly to think about the day whenever he was one of the participants on the Mount of Transfiguration and he saw the Son of God transfigured right there before him and he saw the mighty glory of God. So he says here, I want to put this in parenthesis. I want you to know the Word became flesh and He dwelt among us. I saw it. I beheld His glory. We beheld His glory. Even the glory of the only begotten of the Father. His glory is a glory like no other because He and He alone is the only begotten Son of God whom God saw fit to send into this world to be embodied in human form so that we could see Him in action and see the wonderful things that He was able to do and the love that He was able to show, the mercy that He was able to display and ultimately see how He went to the cross and died for our sin. To be buried, to be raised again. John was one of the ones that was there going to the tomb. The angel saying, He's not here, He's risen. What wonderful words that had to be. The only begotten Son of God. And no doubt John was standing there. I don't know what his position was on the Mount of Ascension whenever the day came that Jesus began to rise and be taken up into heaven from them. And John saw Him go. And I bet you, his eyes filled with tears because he knew he had been an eyewitness of one of the greatest miracles that could ever be performed. Amen. I tell you tonight, beloved, oh, the amazing significance and beauty of the incarnation of Christ. What a miracle. What a miracle. Thank you, Father, for our time together tonight. Thank you for this amazing truth that we have here in your precious word. One verse, but oh, how profound that verse is, giving us so much truth and so much understanding whenever we unpack what is here to be found. Thank you. Thank you for this great miracle. Keep us all safe as we go home in a few minutes. To you be the praise, the honor, and the glory given for all that's done. We only ask in Jesus' name. Amen.